What's up guys, it's Pluskin here and welcome to part 3 of my Metal Gear Solid 2 review. With every single Metal Gear game, I feel there is a narrative, but there's also a meta-narrative. You have the strong anti-war narrative of Metal Gear Solid 3, which also serves as a meta-narrative about the military-industrial complex and how it takes everything away from the men and women that give their lives for it. You have Metal Gear Solid 1 that has the super cool action movie narrative in Shadow Moses, but then has the meta narrative of not being, you know, defined by your genes or where you come from and choosing what you want to make out of life. Sometimes this works out well. Sometimes you have the meta narratives of Metal Gear Solid 4 and 5, which I won't even bother getting into because they just don't really work well and most times they just mess with the actual jive and flow of the game. While Kojima's input into all of these Metal Gear games and using characters as mouthpieces and getting really meta can be really interesting and is a large part of the appeal that these games have, there have also been times where it's just made the game worse. However, with Metal Gear Solid 2, I feel like this is the best example of the narrative and meta-narrative serving each other equally in a way that makes the game, or what's a better way to phrase this, elevates the game from a good game to a great game. Metal Gear Solid 2's narrative and meta-narratives are also the ones that have aged the best and have become more and more relevant as we ventured further and further into the digital age. Because at its core, that's what Metal Gear Solid 2 is about. Someone grappling with the startling realities of the digital age and how it really didn't meet anybody's expectations and blew up into something much harder to understand, never mind control. And the game goes over the effects this has on a person, on their sense of reality and sense of self. This is where our main character comes in, Raiden. More specifically, on a meta level, Raiden is a personification of the process from going Zoomer to Doomer to Bloomer. Now these are internet lingo concepts and I don't know, maybe you're older and you're watching this and you might not understand this, but a Zoomer is someone that's recently been exposed to the internet, probably a little too exposed. They're just cycling through information, really excited, really naive, not really taking the time to process any of it. A Doomer is someone that starts to have or feel the negative impact of overexposure to the internet, desensitization, problems socializing, a hard time finding an identity within so much information, so many options, and so many standards to compare oneself to. And then lastly, the bloomer is someone who overcomes doomer attitudes and finds a way to reconcile this overexposure to the internet that most of us, or if not all of us, have in the digital age, but still find a way to make it work with their sense of reality and their natural progression throughout life. Now that we've clarified what each of those terms mean, let's start going through Raiden's story and his progression through these different phases and how the different characters in the game feed into these different phases respectively. Let's start with the two characters most important to Raiden's development throughout this entire game. The Colonel could be said to represent the influx of information and the internet itself. After all, the Colonel in this game is actually GW, an AI set to learn and monitor and control human behaviors through the control of context on social media. I know social media wasn't really a thing at this point, but that's kind of what it's become the equivalent of. Uh, you could say chat rooms or blog posts if you want to get really 2001, but I don't really see much of a point in that. Point is, the Colonel is the internet in this scenario. He is the spoken or unspoken truth that Raiden as the Zoomer doesn't question. When the Colonel says the mission, says the parameter, says this is what's going on, Raiden blindly believes it. Of course, over the course of the game as he gets more doubtful and then eventually hopeful, he learns to question the Colonel. After he goes through that lapse of, you know, mind-breaking disbelief, 
when he starts seeing that the colonel is actually an AI and starts questioning what's real, what's not, because the colonel is representative of you know his whole basis of reality up to this point. This is his point where he starts to realize the negative effects that just you know basing your entire life around the internet has. And then ultimately he overcomes that and stops questioning himself. We'll get more into that later, but the colonel represents Raiden as the Zoomer and the Doomer, that natural progression of blindly trusting, blindly believing everything you see and you consume on the internet, and then coming to the devastating point when you realize everything is not as it seems. On the other hand, we have Rose, who does two things mainly. The first is that she grounds and she humanizes Raiden. When Raiden talks to someone else, he's Raiden. He is our vessel to enter the Metal Gear world. He is our means of interacting with these characters and seeing the Metal Gear scenario in a way that we hadn't before. When he's talking to Rose, he's no longer that character. He becomes Jack. He becomes his own person. We are forced back into our roles as spectators rather than active participants in the Metal Gear world when he and Rose speak because they speak about their experiences together. They speak about their problems together, stuff that we don't have control over. The second thing that Rose does towards the end of the game is feed into this idea of uncertainty and represents how when someone reaches that doomer phase where they're confused and angry and they just really feel the negative repercussions of again, blindly trusting the internet, they start to doubt and lash out at things they have in their real life. A girlfriend could be a spectacular example of this. You see so much shit and mistrustful things. Like, think about it this way. Let's use this analogy. You spend all your day on Instagram and you see constant posts about cheating or dishonesty or just girls and guys being pretty shit to their partners. And you start questioning the little things that your partner does. You start projecting those insecurities and uncertainties that have been built up within you through social media onto your partner. And Rose's transformation from his girlfriend into this weird patriot AI monster is symbolic of that. So Rose grounds us, or grounds Jack and allows us to see the real him, but she also represents a startlingly accurate part of that Doomer phase where, you know, cyberspace reaches out and affects how you behave and see things in reality so in both of those scenarios she's still grounding jack as a person but in two very different ways one to show who he is as a character and two to show how this doomer mentality how this mind being completely fried desensitized and ideas being put in your head from the internet can negatively leak out into your real life and relationships. So it's mostly through Jack, Rose, and the Colonel that we see this kind of dichotomy between, you know, the internet overexposure to it, the negative repercussions that come from it, and how those repercussions affect us more than just when we're on the internet. Now, let's start getting into some of the other characters. Let's start talking about a character that Jack actually enables us to see as a character for the first time in the series through the vessel mode that he plays as Raiden. That character, of course, is Snake. Now, I know it was apparently a really big deal back in the day when you weren't playing as Snake and you instead had to play as this guy Raiden, but personally, that's what makes Metal Gear Solid 2's story one of the best ones for me, because you get to see Snake as his own character rather than just a vessel you occupy to interact with everyone else. Not to say he wasn't a good character before then, but here you really get to see him with all the strings cut. He's no one's puppet here. In fact, Raiden takes the role of the traditional Metal Gear protagonist, getting fooled by the antagonist and his allies with all the plot twists dropping at the game. Snake's already gone through that, through the Shadow Moses incident, so he's not like that anymore. He's not necessarily jaded, but he's conscious. Now, seeing Snake and how he's grown from Metal Gear Solid 1, and the symbolic transition from player character to NPC that knows exactly what's going on and that's more confident in himself and isn't being controlled, is really a really, it's a brilliant move on behalf of Kojima. 
to really let this character come in their own, one, through letting us see them through another character, but two, by metaphorically and physically cutting off the strings of control that usually occupy, you know, the existence of a Metal Gear protagonist, like poor Raiden in this game. Think about it this way, even when you do control Snake in this game, it's during the Tanker chapter where he ends up getting fooled. It's a setup, and that's the last time he's gonna let that happen. So here, he's under no one's control, and what better way to convey that than literally not letting us play as him. But Snake's coolness goes so much farther than just that. All the little moments when you're playing as Raiden and you can interact with him, fight alongside him, whether it's in the sniper section where you ask him for help, whether it's going at him in non-combat scenarios and just seeing how he interacts with the world, how he reacts to you pointing a gun at him, or how he will take items from you and give items to you, or how he'll chime in codec calls and be the antithesis to the colonel, but I don't want to get too much into that just yet. But just seeing Snake in gameplay while not playing as him and then being able to interact with him is like a Metal Gear fan's dream, right? Because like that final section in Arsenal when I'm fighting against the Tengu, Metal Gear Solid 2 is a fun game, but it's first and foremost a stealth game. And while there's nothing necessarily wrong with most of the combat mechanics here, in fact, I think they're some of the best in the series, it's still not an action game first. It's not going to get the same points in my book as Devil May Cry. So this Tengu section that's very focused on action would not really be as cool if you weren't fighting along Solid Snake and having him comment on whether or not you're hurt, if you're doing good, or him handing you ammo. It's really freaking cool. The last thing I want to talk about Snake is how he fits into the meta narrative besides not just being controlled. You see, if Raiden is the zoomer, doomer, bloomer process of being, Snake is that friend that has it figured out. He really is the Chad. He comes in here, he's confident of himself, he knows what he's doing, he knows where he's going. He's already been through that doomer stage and he's already overcome it. And he's like that supportive friend to Raiden. He helps him get his grip back on reality when Raiden's going through that full doomer phase, doubting the reality of his girlfriend, the reality of the mission, the validity of himself. Snake is that one friend or supportive person that pulls you out of that kind of scenario. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, don't worry, but if you're going through a time where you're not in a really good headspace and you know someone that you can reach out to, go ahead and do it, because I guarantee they want to be there for you. Just like Snake wants to be there for Raiden, well, not just for Raiden, but just generally for people going through that. He wants to fight for a better future for future generations. He wants to make that difference. I'm sure your friends or your family want to make that same difference for you. So yeah, Snake is really cool because we get to see him as his own character. He's grown so much from Metal Gear Solid 1. We get to fight alongside him and have him interact with us in ways you don't really see anywhere else in the series. And he's just representative of the Chad and just something you should really strive to be in the digital age where you know how to draw the line between fake and real. Moving on to our antagonist, the first one we're going to talk about is one that isn't necessarily disappointing to me, but one I feel could be handled better. Ocelot is a strong enough character on his own and trying to sandwich liquid back in there through his arm and everything like that. As much as I love Metal Gear Solid 2 and think its narrative is amazing, I don't think liquid being there, even if it's not really real or whatever is going on, it doesn't really detract from anything that's happening there, but I find it really unnecessary and if I had to point out a flaw, that would probably be it. But Ocelot's role throughout this game is really nice because he plays a really subtle antagonist. He's not constantly going after Raiden or trying to rile him up, but he's there to make sure things go along and according to the Patriot's plans. So when he reveals all of this towards the end, it's a really cool moment on top of Arsenal gear where it's just betrayal after betrayal and then Ocelot's at the head of it all and then you have that really cool scene where he takes the ray and Snake dives in after him. There's a lot of cool Ocelot moments in here. I still think Snake Eater Ocelot is the best Ocelot, but yeah, Ocelot's a really cool 
kind of subversive antagonist that waits to the end to really show his fangs, and it really has a strong impact. Olga isn't necessarily an antagonist per se, but she still faces or shows up as a sort of challenge to overcome. Of course, you have the tanker mission where you have the boss fight with her, but more so when you're playing as Raiden in the plant chapter, she kind of represents the same kind of branch of antagonism as the Patriots and the Colonel do, in the sense that she adds to your sense of uncertainty. She shows up as an antagonist as herself, but then when she's playing the role of the ninja and she's helping you, but then not really being clear about why she's helping you, and then doing a lot of things that feel really scripted, it really puts you at a level of unease. And this is what makes Metal Gear Solid 2 great, the confusion that leads up to the big reveals that make you go, holy shit, because you weren't really seeing anything coming because the antagonist played with your expectations. And Olga plays that role really well. But the best antagonist in this game, and the Metal Gear series, might I say, is Solidus Snake. He is criminally underrated. Having like a perfect clone of the big boss who was in league with the Patriots but is now striving against them, mirroring Solid Snake and Raiden's goals but in a way that's still not as morally acceptable in the sense that he wants to, you know, blow up hydrogen bombs and he doesn't mind killing tons of innocent people. In a way, he's just as bad as the Patriots, but that whole theme of, you know, he's somewhat sympathetic because he's trying to escape the same mechanisms of control as you are is really freaking cool. Besides that, I like Solidus Snake as an antagonist because while he's still definitely showy and he still likes to monologue, he has this sense of straightforward brutality. Whereas someone like Volgan, for example, felt cartoonishly evil, Solidus feels like all of the negative traits of Solid Snake and Big Boss compiled into one person. This really is a guy that even if he does have ideals, he just can't escape his bloodlust. And unlike the other two, there's no, you know, charisma or ideology painted in a way to kind of hide the heinous crimes that he's committing. And as an antagonist, that works fantastic. The Dr. Octopus suit is also really cool. I'm not too much of a fan of the Harrier boss fight, like it's okay. Again, like I said in my last video, I'm not a big fan of the boss fights in this game, but the Solidus boss fight is amazing. The way he can like whip off buildings with the tentacles, shoot missiles out of them. The way that it's like a sword fight is really cool and dramatic and not necessarily like CQC based, it's really something different. Solidus just brings so many different and unique features of gameplay, storytelling, and antagonist traits to the table that we don't really see in future Metal Gear games. He's much more competent than Liquid, not as sympathetic as the boss. He falls into this perfect middle ground zone where he's an antagonist that you don't hate, you understand, but at the same time you know you need to take him down. He's fun to fight, he's fun to see, I wish he showed up more in this game, and I wish he showed up more in the series. Everyone keeps talking about how, oh, I want another uh, Metal Gear game where you play as the boss, or I want another Metal Gear game where you play as big boss in the 80s. Let's get a Solidus game. If you want to see a Solidus game, leave a like on this video and comment how you think that would play out down below. But yeah, Part of the reason why Metal Gear Solid 2 is so great is because you have Solidus playing this dark big boss slash solid snake role, a mirroring of a character that we love in a state that's just so raw and brutal, but still idealistic and suited to being a Metal Gear villain where there's not necessarily sympathy, but understanding. And that's very hard to do with an antagonist. Vamp, I feel, is just there for when they need something dramatic to happen, so I'm not going to talk too much about him. That man gives reason and depth to Peter Stillman's story, but Fortune is the one that's really worthwhile in terms of talking about here. The whole tragic heroine and the way she's, you know, playing through this game as the one that you're supposed to feel sympathy for and how it feels so forced because it actually ends up being a ruse that even she isn't played onto. 
Fortune is another one of those characters like Olga that adds to our sense of confusion, but in a much more sympathetic way. Whereas Olga towards the end just says, oh yeah, I'm doing this because I have my kid as a hostage. Let's not really talk about this much. Fortune, we see her suffering throughout the game. The, she's always crying. She has this persona. And when her breakdown happens, it happens at the point when all of the plot twists are coming up. So it's much easier to sympathize with her. Still, I don't want to spend too much time talking about them because I don't really have too much to say about Dead Cell. While it might have dropped the ball a little bit with the boss fight characters you fight with, the supporting characters in this game are really interesting in a way that we don't really see too often. Now, let's talk about the Emrics because this is probably one of the most interesting and fucked up subplots within this game and also within the Metal Gear series. You have to rescue Emma, who's this like master coder and can take down GW. You get this cute moment when you're swimming over to her and you see Rose like giving you shit for staring at her for too long. As a character on her own, I mean, I guess she's interesting enough. She's supposed to be like the really cute smart girl that's low key kind of dirty, which ties into the what we're about to be talking about. But she really gets interesting with her relationship with Otacon. Yeah, you didn't think I was going to forget about him, did you? Now, her relationship with Otacon is ambiguously incestuous. It's really messed up in the sense where, okay, so let's go, let's go to Metal Gear Solid 5 for a second. Venom Snake decides not to kill Huey and instead banish him to the United States, which, as we know, is one of the worst punishments you can bestow on someone. <laughs> Huey ends up marrying a woman and, you know, buying a home or whatever, he finds his son Hal, and then him, Hal, this woman, and this woman's daughter all live together as a family. Now, Otacon, somehow being the biggest chick magnet on the planet, ends up sleeping with his stepmother, which causes Huey to kill himself and take Emma Emmerich with him. Why would Huey want to take a child with him while committing suicide? This is Huey Emmerich. We don't put anything past the guy. Anyways, this gives Emma this horrible fear of you know, water and drowning, which ties into her whole escort section and really grounds her as a human being. So I like that. Makes her a believable character, how they explain all that. But yeah, after, you know, Huey kills himself after finding out that Otacon is sleeping with his wife, um, Otacon leaves the other two and Emma sees this as a form of abandonment because she doesn't really understand what's going on. So her and Otacon are meeting here again for the first time and Otacon cares, Emma cares, but naturally there's that sense of tension there in more ways than one. But ultimately, this really feeds into another Otacon tragic moment where while you're escorting Emma, she gets stabbed by Vamp. Again, very useful for whenever you need something dramatic to happen, just throw in Vamp. But anyway, she ends up getting stabbed and is taken into the lab to try to fight GW. Her thing doesn't work, but no one really wants to mention anything because she's dying. And this is when she and Otacon reveal all of this stuff and Snake and Raiden are just sitting there like, D did they just admit to incest? Dude, just don't even bring it up. This happens and then you have Otacon crying and let's be honest, a voice acting moment that could have been done better, but at the same time, it has heart, so yeah. So Otacon is crying because he didn't honor Emma's dying words and he feels really stupid and guilty for that. He also has to leave her body behind because the big shell is starting to sink because Arsenal is taking off and you have this like really cool moment where they're all like pulling together Raiden's trying to like, you know, keep calm after starting to catch on to all this stuff. He's almost gone full Doomer. Snake is always confident, headstrong. Again, he's the Chad. Otacon overcomes the trials and tribulations of losing Emma and forces himself to keep cool. You have this really cool, badass walking scene. And then one of my favorite moments in the entire Metal Gear series that really just shows rather than tells how close Snake and Otacon have become. Otacon continues to cry and eventually he makes it out of there and takes the hostages away. And that's really where his major roles in the story comes to a close. But yeah, this, this whole subplot was messed up and 
the way Emma and Otacon end up interacting after, you know, having their ties subtly hinted at throughout the entire game is interesting and blows up in your face in a way that no one really expected. Again, one of the reasons why Metal Gear Solid 2 is amazing. It's constantly defying your expectations and keeping you guessing. But yeah, Otacon and Emma, messed up story, but serves an interesting purpose throughout the larger picture. So I like it and I'm glad it's here and I'm glad Huey met a suiting end. Peter Stillman, let's go through the supporting characters just as a way to end off this video. Really underrated character, not appreciated enough. Yeah, he's just there to help you get to know the big shells I talked about before in my last video, part two, focusing on the gameplay. He, you know, really serves the purpose of just, here's a task to do while you go around the big shell and get familiar with the stealth puzzles before the game starts throwing real difficulty at you. But his story is one, again, of lies and deception, keeping in line with everything in Metal Gear Solid 2 about how there was a church bombing that he failed to stop. He fakes losing a leg so people feel sorry for him rather than blaming him, but he overcomes, again, like Raiden and everyone, and Otacon, overcomes the lies by facing the truth and then moving forward in life. A really positive message this game keeps on reinforcing. Now this brings us to our conclusion. And that conclusion is that Metal Gear Solid 2, while being a really entertaining story with plot twists, ultimately is the story of overcoming the hardships of the digital age by finding what's real in front of you and moving forward with that in mind. The Patriots could be an analogy for so many things. The internet itself, the billionaire cults that control the world, the corporations that own and censor media, or just the harmful trends that come up on social media. That is that force that we're all exposed to and all brought down by. And like the characters in this game, whether it's Raiden getting help from Snake to realize what's really important to him, becoming that bloomer that says, yeah, you know what, a lot of this stuff messed me up, but I'm gonna focus on the reality that's in front of me, in this case, his girlfriend and their baby together, and he's going to move forward with that. Stillman is able to accept himself by facing the truth and then actually working towards fixing his mistakes. Otacon faces the truth of his horrible past and deals with not knowing or having false expectations for the internet in the uh, Tanker chapter where he thinks he can really expose this and it's not just going to be censored or washed off and, you know, dealing with it and being like, okay, I guess I have to do something different. There's all these characters in this game that have to pick themselves up and focus on the reality that's in front of them. As Snake says in his final speech, don't focus so much on the words, find the meaning behind the words. Don't focus so much on the messages that are constantly flowing into your head every day when you're on social media. Don't question, oh shit, let's go back to let's go back to our girlfriend and infidelity analogy. Oh shit, I see so many posts talking about this stuff. I wonder if it's happening to me. Don't. Live in reality. Focus on what's around you, your friends, your family, your job, your school, whatever it is. Live by your own standards and choose for yourself what to pass on. Don't be something because there's a trend telling you to be that way. Don't hate yourself because you don't look like a, a picture you see on Instagram. Don't doubt the people that love you just because you see all of these horror stories online. Find your own purpose, find your own sense of meaning, something worth fighting for and spreading, and do that. But make sure that it's yours and make sure it's real because you see it as real. It's real because it's something that you do. Again, the girlfriend analogy. What's real is what you have with that girl, not what everyone else is sharing online or how relationships are portrayed in the media. What's real is what's happening there between you and your partner. That's what Metal Gear Solid 2 is about. That's what these characters show. That's a crazy positive message, and that's one of the many reasons why the narrative and meta-narrative make Metal Gear Solid 2 one of the best games ever made. Now, I hope you guys join me on my supposedly last part, part four, where I go over all the bonus features and sandbox elements of Metal Gear Solid 2. 
And yeah, I'm not sure when I'm going to get that out, but when I do, if you enjoyed this one, if you enjoyed my other two parts, tune in for that one there. Till next time, this has been Bliskin, over and out.